Congratulations on Mars. Big fan of the show. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So this um, into season two now. Uh, you know, this whole mashup of actual footage, actual documentary, and the show itself. Uh, what kind of uh, stuff that you can offer us for season two as far as those aspects? Uh, well, um, I have not seen season two. Um, so all I know is my interview segment, which is just, you know, kind of, uh, again, similar to my part in season one, where I'm just sitting there answering the questions they ask. <laughs> uh, so I wish I knew more about the show. They, they haven't sent me the, the secret link that lets me watch it yet. Yeah, I, I have seen it, oh, actually. Have? I oh, have, okay. I have. And, uh, well, I think that they do, they do a really lovely job of telling a very human story that's very character-driven. So at no point do you think, oh, that character is doing this in order to make the particular point that the expert talking head just brought up. Mm. It, instead, um, they, you know, they have the, the characters go through these dilemmas, which have to do with living in an isolated colony with very small numbers of people dependent on a very distant source. And um, the characters within that are completely believable. So the scripted and the non-scripted parts really just fit beautifully together. Speaking of believable, so I know one of the things that, the things that I love about The Martian is that, you know, they try to get so close to accuracy. Look, how close to accurate is this show, do you think? Uh, again, I'm sorry, I haven't seen season two. No, no, not season uh, two, there's the show in general. Oh, yeah. it's really, it's really solid. Yeah. I mean, there's always going to be a few little aspects of it. There's no such thing as a 100% accurate science fiction show. Um, there's always going to be a few things. I mean, in the, in the Martian, the sandstorm at the beginning is impossible because oh. Mars's uh, atmosphere is not that thick. But, um, but yeah, no, they're really solid. They're really, re really, really high on the, uh, on the hardness scale of science fiction. I, I, I do tend to think that just again from a, from a historical point of view that the scientific community is is maybe a tiny bit impossibly pure minded okay. you know yeah. um, just uh, very ideologically perfect which you know you look at scientists in the past you know, the Royal Society of London had plenty of bar fights and <laughs> sniping at each other and character assassinations so you'd maybe expect to see a tiny bit more of that. Uh, so um, talk a bit about um, you know a lot of kids out there want to be astronauts uh -huh. so but can you give like an advice for my young viewers out there exactly how they can be astronauts? Not just like, oh, I want to be an astronaut. Like, so, what are some so I never imagined myself being an astronaut. Yeah. But I was doing all these things like studying hard. I was an athlete. I was, you know, working out, playing sports and, and working on teams because teamwork is really one of the biggest things of working and living in space effectively because if you can't work together as a team, you perish, you falter, you die. And I think that, you know, getting those type in good nutrition, good hygiene, all those things, um, being a little bit organized because stuff floats everywhere, you gotta figure out how to get all your stuff back in this place or you're impacting someone else's work in space because your underwear floating in their face, you know? But um, those are some of the things and just believing yourself and working hard. That's what it, to me, those are the things that got me to space. So, uh, thanks to SpaceX and Elon Musk, is the possibility of colonizing Mars, you know, is the idea much closer now than ever before? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, NASA has no real plans to land humans on Mars at all. Wow. They have a sort of a fuzzy plan to orbit the planet sometime in the 2030s with their new SLS launch system and their Orion space capsule, which just looks like a big Apollo capsule. And the real innovation that is occurring now is what's, what's happening is that the ability to get into space and to put humans into space is transferring from governments into the private world. And so SpaceX has one mission and one mission only, and that's to create a sustainable um, uh, base on Mars that humans can live in um, independent of Earth. And no other no other company is trying to do that. So they are the true innovators in this process, and they're absolutely determined to do it. Last question. Mars, everybody sees Mars as a way for us to start over, for human survival to continue. Um, I mean, have we given up on Earth? Is it, I mean, is it still worth salvaging here, or what, what's... I think it is, but he might have a different point of view. But I think that even if it, even if it isn't, I think it is salvageable, but I think that even in, without that, there's this, this desire to go and be an interplanetary species. I think there's that desire, and it's been there for a long, long time. Now you go. The, the, eventually, humans will go extinct if they live on Earth forever, uh, or try to live on Earth forever. So you have to become, eventually, a space-traveling species, a nomadic species in space. And so Mars is just the first step.